Good evening and welcome to the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at Berkshire Community College. My name is Carol Allman Morton. I have a few short announcement, announcements and then we'll get started. To learn more about programming at Ollie at BCC, you can check out our website, berkshireollie.org. Be sure to look at the Ollie at BCC calendar of events, again at berkshireollie.org forward slash events. Registration for our spring semester is now open and classes will begin next week. So if you want to sign up now, today is the day uh, and you can see the listing of classes at, again at berkshireolly.org forward slash spring 2024. We'd like to thank the Berkshire Supergenarians whose gift made it possible for us to get the word out to more people about this lecture series. As we go through the lecture, if you have questions, please put them in the chat and we'll do our best to get to as many as we can. And now I'll turn it over to Mary Jane and Corvia Matina to introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you so much, Carol. And thank you. Um, let's let's begin with the thank yous. Um, uh, first of all, to the Ali office, because um, Carol, uh, Judith and Ray are just extraordinary and have been outstanding in helping to put this series together. And I so much appreciate their work and efforts to thank all of you for tuning in uh, to the fourth and final um, lecture in this four part 21st century medicine series. Um, we really have been delighted with the um, with the lectures that we have heard up to this point um, on the four P's um, with Mark Pettis and uh, and prevention uh, and lifestyle medicine with Hod Lipson and uh, predictive the predictive aspects of 21st century medicine and his information on AI last week with Perry Wilson. Um, and the, the patient-physician uh, interface. And this week, we are just delighted to have Dr. Jordan Smoller um, to talk to us about precision medicine and uh, or personalized medicine and the All of Us Research Program. Dr. Smoller received his uh, MD degree from Harvard, um, and he is both a psychiatrist, an epidemiologist, as well as a geneticist. And um, uh, as far as this particular talk is concerned, he's also the lead PI of the New England Precision Medicine Consortium, which is part of the NIH All of Us Research Program. And I am a big supporter of All of Us, the All of Us Research Program, and Dr. Smoller will give us far more information on this. So without further ado, Dr. Smoller, it's yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mary Jane, and thank you to everybody for joining today. And uh, I look forward to, to talking with you and also to having time to do some Q&A and, and address questions about anything that sparks your interest as we go along. Um, as you heard, I'm gonna be talking about this concept of precision medicine. And I actually think what we'll talk about tonight kind of draws together some of the aspects of the things that you've heard about in this series. Um, and I'm also going to illustrate some of it with some of the research that we're doing in the area of psychiatry and mental health, which uh, is an area of great interest to lots of people, but it's a, also an area where we need more precision medicine. So let me tell you a little bit about that, and I'll just open up by seeing if I can bring up my slides for you. Okay. Okay. Um, and we'll go full screen. Okay, I'm assuming that worked and we'll get started. So first of all, um, the, the area of medicine, of biomedicine, obviously is concerned with uh, improving our quality of life, improving our health, reducing mortality and morbidity. And we know that uh, we face lots of um, issues that, uh, that are leading causes of death that are very common, um, heart disease, cancer, COVID. This was, uh, these are data from uh, 2021, actually, when COVID was maybe at its peak. And you can see that it had moved into COVID, of course, you know, prior to 2020 wasn't on this list. It wasn't on anybody's mind, but it moved into the third leading cause of death. Um, but one of the things to know about this is that there are a lot of disparities. Not everybody is affected equally by various kinds of diseases. And so um, we, you know, we see uh, 
death rates, for example, that differ sometimes substantially uh, by, in this case, uh, sex or race, ethnicity. And we don't have a great understanding of the reasons for that in many cases. Um, the, the leading causes of years lived with disability is a slightly different look at our overall health as a nation. And um, the, the reason it's different in part, obviously what I was showing you before was mortality data. What are the leading, leading causes of death? But um, many of those were diseases of older age, typically. You can see here that the number one cause of years lived with disability, that means years of life in which, uh, you know, whatever condition it is that we're talking about has a substantial impact on people's functioning. Those are mental and substance use disorders, which I will talk more about. Uh, and part of the reason that those are so high on this list is a they they take a terrible toll but they also also um are uh typically things that start earlier in life and therefore people live with these conditions for many many years of their lives musculoskeletal conditions of course arthritis and so on is high up on this list um but you can see that uh we have a lot of big health problems that we need to deal with and the current state of medicine in many ways, although we have had major advances in, in how we diagnose and treat and prevent many diseases, we also know that a lot of what happens is still a kind of one size fits all trial and error approach. That is, if you are uh, go to a physician and uh, have whatever condition it is, let's say it's um, uh, well, let's say it's depression, which is an area that I'm uh, engaged in. We have treatments that are, are very helpful, but I don't know ahead of time what's going to work for you as an individual. And also the, the, the treatment choices that we have are typically based on clinical trials. And what you're looking at in a clinical trial is usually, does this treatment do better on average than, say, a placebo or another treatment? that we're comparing it to. And if it does, that becomes part of our, you know, treatment arm armamentarium, but that doesn't mean it works for everybody. And so uh, we know that, you know, none of us is the average, uh, we're all unique. And that means there's a lot of opportunity for us to do better. Um, when we talk about medications, this is this is a little bit of an older slide now, but it's no no less true. Um, and what this is showing you is the percentage of patients for whom a particular drug in a class, let's say, is ineffective on average. So what this means is for the for the um, darkened figures that you see there, on average, um, that treatment, which may be first line, is not necessarily going to work. So that leads us to this concept of precision medicine. And precision medicine is an emerging approach for treatment, prevention, uh, diagnosis that takes into account individual differences or individual variability in our lifestyle, socioeconomics, environment, biology, genes, and it's a different way of looking at things, um, which really, again, is focused not on the averages or what's the average that works, but um, what if we know something about people individually uh, and how that those individual differences mean that they might do better with one treatment versus another treatment, or uh, that you know some kind of uh, preventive intervention might be more effective for them uh, than another. And that's really what we're trying to work towards. You know, there's some familiar examples of this that I that I often like to think about. One of them is eyeglasses. So, you know, you can see I'm wearing eyeglasses. Uh, if you uh, have, you know, if you're nearsighted or you're, you know, have trouble reading, you could go down to your local drugstore and pick up a pair of reading glasses off the shelf. And they would probably work pretty well, 
but they would never be as good as a prescription that was designed for you. And that's, you know, that's the way we usually do it, right? Blood types, you know, we, we wouldn't, unless it was an emergency, think about um, giving a transfusion to a patient without knowing their particular blood type, because obviously the results could be catastrophic. And antibiotics are also a version of this. So if you have an infection, let's say a urinary tract infection, um, although sometimes we just go ahead and treat that regardless, but you know many infections, pneumonia, et cetera, somebody's gonna take a culture and figure out what is the, what is the bacteria or pathogen that's causing your infection, because then we can guide a treatment that we think is gonna work best for you. So in some ways, this is all very familiar, but more recently, we've seen, uh, a more 21st century, perhaps, um, version of that kind of approach in the development of cancer drugs, for example, that are targeted to specific genetic mutations in a tumor, let's say, or um, treatments for, I'll, I'll mention some rare diseases that have really transformed our, under, you know, our, our ability to help people because we know something about the underlying biology or um, new ways of uh, predicting or stratifying, as we would say, risk for things like heart disease that would tell us um, you would probably do better starting on a statin earlier rather than later, let's say. So that that's the kind of thing that we're um, beginning to see. And I mentioned this <clears throat> rare disease. Um, this is just pretty remarkable what has transpired in a number of cases now. Um, this was one of the first real uh, breakthroughs, cystic fibrosis, which you may have heard of, but maybe not that familiar with, but it's not all that rare. One in 3,000 newborns of European ancestry uh, have this condition, and it's a recessive mutation, and it was about, uh, what is it now, 35 or so years ago that the gene was identified. Um, but up until very recently, this was a uh, a condition that we couldn't really do that much about. It affects multiple organs, and the life expectancy back in, say, the 80s, around the time this gene was identified, was less than 25 years ago, less than 25 years. Um, we didn't have any treatments that actually targeted the cause, and now we have precision medicine treatments that target actually what's going on at the molecular level in this condition, and they are relevant for about 90% of patients and have already, uh, we've seen a doubling of life expectancy and that's expected to continue. You may have seen recently gene therapies, again, based on the molecular understanding of certain conditions like sickle cell anemia uh, and uh, other rare conditions that are really transformative in the sense that we really didn't have that much specifically to do for some of these diseases. I also mentioned the cancer story, which may be familiar to you. That is over the last um, you know, decade or so, we've seen the development of cancer treatments, chemotherapies that actually target the, the cancer driver mutations or other mutations that are responsible for or that make uh, certain types of cancers uh, really go and and or metastasize or just sort of develop, and we've seen uh, you know a number of these now approved and are you know you see commercials on TV regularly for uh, these kinds of drugs. They don't work for everybody, and that's part of the you know, but that's part of the point. In other words, for those people that they do help they can help dramatically. And it is no longer a one size fits all. Cancer chemotherapy and cancer treatment in general, in some ways is you know one of the most familiar cases where we have some pretty uh, blunt instruments uh, for treatment. You know, chemotherapies uh, often cause obviously tremendous uh, side effects and, and serious problems, toxicities, uh, similarly radiation and so on. And here are some uh, drugs which in certain cases, um, when the tumor is genetically uh, going to be responsive, can really make a huge difference. Now, 
we have a lot of new resources that we can bring to bear. Some of the reason that we haven't been able to do this before is that we didn't really have the technology or the scientific understanding to make this kind of thing possible. And now we have all kinds of new biological tools and understandings of how the genome works, not only what our genetic sequence is, but how those genes are operating, what regulates them, what proteins they're making, and what are the structure of those proteins. We have uh, new ways of analyzing data, like machine learning, that allow us to uh, you know, sift through just mountains and mountains of data to find a signal. We have digital uh, technologies where uh, we can monitor how people are doing individually on a you know intensive basis if we need to. We have electronic health records or EHRs that capture lots of data about health and as I'll mention in a little bit, uh, have proved uh, very useful in understanding some of the genetic effects of uh, uh, on disease, but also um, the development of uh, risk algorithms. And I think you heard a little bit about artificial intelligence. We'll talk a little more about that. In many cases, health systems and electronic health records are linked to biobanks where people have donated specimens or samples that can then be used for discovery as well. So that has really opened up a lot of possibilities. And I'm going to detour here sort of uh, to talk a little bit about uh, precision psychiatry, which um, again, this is the field that I I am in, and it's a field where I you know I'm very eager for us to to bring some of these advances too because psychiatric disorders, as you undoubtedly know, are common. One in one in two of us, or more than fifty percent of us, will meet criteria for a psychiatric disorder at some point in our lives. And as I mentioned earlier, they tend to come on early in life, which means that people you know, live with these conditions, which are sometimes chronic uh, for a long time. And uh, we talked about the fact that they are responsible for tremendous morbidity, but also mortality. People with severe mental illness, schizophrenia, severe bipolar disorder, have uh, 10 to 25 years shortened lifespan. That's a, a remarkable um, figure. And Suicide, of course, one of the, the complications of um, uh, many of these illnesses is uh, a growing problem. It's actually reached uh, you know the highest level in years uh, just recently. Um, and it's now the second leading cause of death among young people. We also um, need new treatments. So uh, we have treatments that are very helpful for many people. They're life-saving for some people, but almost all of them are based on our, a biological understanding that's, you know, decades old. And the, the these little bubbles here that you see for different conditions tells you something about what's the uh, treatment response that we see. And again, for many people, these are very helpful, but for many others, they're not as helpful as, they, as we need them to be, or they're very difficult to tolerate, or they have terrible side effects. So we have a lot of work to do in this area. And uh, that was what motivated us to start a, a center here at Mass General Hospital, where I am, uh, to really try to bring this notion of precision psychiatry forward and find ways to move from what we call innovation to implementation, meaning uh, discovery and innovation that has a path to actually changing uh, patient care or improving uh, mental health care. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples. There are many, but I'll just give you a couple that uh, we've been working on. One of the tools that we have at our disposal, which I think you've heard about, is artificial intelligence. And you've heard about, obviously, uh, well, you're hearing about it constantly now with large language models and chat GPT and so on. But it's been around for a while, relatively speaking. And we, you know, I think until very recently, uh, it was it was still, uh, you know, 
I think, a part of our lives, sometimes in ways we didn't totally appreciate. But, you know, a familiar example is um, a number of companies that have used artificial intelligence very effectively uh, to, uh, you know, like Google and Facebook and Netflix uh, to predict what you might want to buy or see. And, and the way they do this is they take vast amounts of data about people's behavior, apply these artificial intelligence models and use that to predict their future behavior. So if I know something about you or about what you've liked before or the kind of person you are, uh, I might think you, you might wanna buy this or you might wanna see this in your feed. Well, we can take that same kind of approach, but apply it to improving people's health. And I'll give you uh, some of it, some examples of that, how we're doing some of that in the realm of psychiatry. I mentioned suicide, which is a problem that we are very uh, invested in addressing. And in fact, we just recently launched a new center for suicide research and prevention. But in this country, um, it's actually more than a million and a half now suicide attempts annually, a 35% increase in deaths by suicide since 1999 in the 21st century, even more among young people. And as I mentioned, it's now the second leading cause of death and it's, it's enormously tragic and costly. We think that healthcare systems um, are a particularly important venue or opportunity to make a difference. And that is in part because most people who attempt or die by suicide are seen by a healthcare provider in the preceding weeks, more than half in the, in the month before the event. Now, uh, only a minority of people uh, actually disclose their intent or suicidality to healthcare profession professionals. And clinicians, uh, research shows, <clears throat> we clinicians don't really do that well at identifying who's really at risk. And so one of the things that we've been working on now for a while is trying to leverage big data and artificial intelligence or machine learning to see if we can help people and clinicians who are, who are treating them to, to reduce this problem. And so one of the things that we did a while ago was to use some of these approaches uh, in the, the vast resource of data that are available in the electronic health record in our health system. Uh, we had data for nearly 2 million patients and develop algorithms that might identify people who really were at high risk. And we were able to do that. And the algorithm detected 45% of all suicide attempts or deaths um, with high specificity on average two to three years in advance. We then uh, asked whether we could um, sort of replicate that elsewhere using a similar approach. And we found in health care systems uh, geographically dispersed that we could. And in fact, the, the performance was basically just as good. We did studies showing that it would be cost effective to implement these kinds of models in primary care. And then we prospectively tested how good are these models compared to how clinicians do. And we did that by uh, with colleagues, a study in our psychiatric emergency services where about a little more than 1,800 patients who came in were assessed by clinicians. And we asked the clinicians who were treating them, what do you think is the likelihood that this person will attempt suicide in the next month or the next six months? And then we used our model along with a, a brief survey uh, administered to the patient at the time of, of the visit to also predict um, what's the likelihood. And uh, I won't go into all the details, but what we found was for those patients, those people who the model uh, identified as at high risk, that is they were in the top 10% of predicted risk, 40% of those people went on to make a suicide attempt in the next month and nearly 60% by six months. So those are 
those are large numbers. And that's partly what's uh, spurred us to do the work to establish this center that I mentioned. And we've also built a uh, an app or a clinical decision support tool that can go into the ele electronic health record uh, to provide this kind of information to clinicians at the point of care, to document uh, and generate a safety plan for patients and to guide the clinician through an individualized care plan. And right now we're in the midst of gearing up to do a randomized controlled study to see, does this in fact uh, make a difference? So that's one approach. Another approach, as I mentioned, is um, choosing medication, the trial and error problem. Um, and going back to depression, which I was talking about before, again, if I'm seeing a patient uh, with depression and uh, we decide we want to start a medication, there are usually about four first-line kinds of medications that we might start. One would be an SSRI, which would be something like Prozac or Zoloft or Lexapro. Another class are SNRI. You may have heard of some of these as well, like Effexor or Cymbalta. Uh, Bupropion is another, also known as Welbutrin, or Mirtazapine, also known as Remeron. So those are kind of the first line choices. Most people start with an SSRI. Um, but again, we may not know what you are, we, we don't know ahead of time, typically, what you're going to respond to. And actually, Right now, this is what clinicians <clears throat> know, essentially. So if you took two patients who were coming in and I and, and and you know, you asked me what's the probability that they would respond to each of these kinds of medicines, the data suggests it's about half, 50-50, that they would respond, and it's about equal uh, for each of them. Whoops. Go back here. Um, but of course, the reality is that's probably not going to happen. And to, to the extent that we don't start with a, a, the medicine that's going to work best, it might mean weeks of not getting better. People have, you know, all the difficulties associated with that, like, um, you know, not being able to go to work or function uh, or having side effects that they can't tolerate. So what we did was we used artificial intelligence, again, with electronic health records and built a uh, an algorithm that could predict uh, what was the likelihood that you would respond. So if we take these two patients, Tom and Megan, and we apply this algorithm, it was correctly predicting the response that we saw actually in the record about 74% of the time. <clears throat> and what you see here are that for these two patients who, these are actually you know not their real names, but real data, uh, Tom is predicted to respond to a, uh, has a 94% probability of responding to a, an SSRI. Megan, only a 28% probability. And of course, that's probably the first thing we would reach for. But the other thing the model can do is say, well, what else would you respond? How would it compare? How do these four options compare for you? And so then we can get uh, an estimate of that. So for Tom, actually, he does well on all of them, although the SSRI was the best. Megan would be predicted to do best on mirtazapine, which is something we might not reach for as a first-line agent. Um, what about prevention? And you've talked about this in this series as well, but again, let's go back to depression. What do we know about preventing depression? What can we do? Well, one thing is Try not to have affected relatives. That is, try not to have relatives who have depression because it can run in families. Another is try not to have a difficult childhood. And another would be, you know, don't use drugs. Uh, these are not easy to, uh, to change or to do something about, right? Um, but we have actually now done a series of studies using big data uh, that, that fit with other research done in other ways that have identified um, really two factors that are not only associated with lowering the risk of depression, but we're able to show because we can use genetic data that that effect is seen regardless of people's genetic risk 
And regardless of whether they have had a history of um, real childhood adversity or, or trauma, um, and I'll let you think for a second, uh, I'll look at the chat. Maybe somebody wants to um, uh, put in the chat what your guess is. What would those two things be? Any guesses? Alcohol use, but well, alcohol use to lower nuclear family. But remember, we're trying to say what can lower your risk? Diet and exercise, social interaction, social interaction, social connectedness. Nice. Community. Yeah. 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 So we're seeing a lot of social connection love having a stable living situation right okay faith positive social interactions family meditation okay like your job that's always helpful um okay so here's what we've seen in these big studies where we've looked at genetics, environment, and looked at, and we've been able to also use statistical methods that can tell us whether something is likely to be a causal effect. So, and you you all sort of nailed this, I think. The two things that we see over and over are physical activity and social connectedness. And uh, we see it in a variety of different contexts. Um, and it's really pretty striking. Uh, so, um, that's one thing that, that we can learn, you know, sort of a form of precision prevention, that is to really identify what are those factors that are not just associated with the prevention or the reduced risk of something, but that we can say is causally related. The last story I'll tell you is work that we've done to try to address that problem of, uh, can we find new ways to treat a condition? And this is where we get to genetics and developing new medications that maybe have a genetic link or suggested by genetics, just like we saw in the cancer situation. And this, this is a little bit of a complicated story, but I'll just give you the, the bottom line simply. Um, so uh, in very large scale gene uh, genetic studies that we've done uh, and others have done, there is a variation in a gene which is called SLC39A8, which is obviously not a important thing for you to remember, but it's it's strongly associated with the risk of schizophrenia. By itself, it has a tiny effect, but statistically it's, it's associated. And it turns out that that gene is involved in how cells take up manganese. Um, manganese is a, you know, it's a, min it's a mineral. I mean, you can get it over the counter, of course, uh, but it turns out that manganese is essential for a biochemical process called glycosylation. That's a process in which uh, sugar uh, molecules essentially are added to proteins and lipids on, for example, the surface of cells. Why is that important? Because it turns out that those kinds of structures on cells are important to how you know the developing brain finds where uh, neurons find where they're supposed to end up in the brain. It's in, involved in a whole variety of processes that are important in brain function as well as uh, elsewhere. Um, in, in studies using our biobank where we are at our institution, we found that people who carry this variant actually have lower levels detectably of uh, manganese in their blood. And if you do fancy biochemical profiling on cells, you can see that the the glycosylation or the sugar structures that are on their cells are less developed is one way of looking at it. Uh, and the, the reason that that would make sense is that this manganese is sort of a cofactor for glycosylation. You need it around to have those enzymes uh, go to completion. Uh, and so, you know, you see changes. We uh, This is work led by... Uh, 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 young young scientist Robbie Mueller, who not only did that work, but then also engineered to uh, 
insert the, the mutation in mice and uh, we see these changes in glycosylation in the mouse brain that led us to the hypothesis that glycosylation and glycobiology, a whole area that we hadn't thought of in mental health particularly, uh, might be important in, in schizophrenia. Again, this is a gene that's been linked to schizophrenia. Uh, and it turns out other genes that have been linked to schizophrenia also connect to this pathway. And interestingly, um, there rare, there's a rare condition in which this gene really doesn't function at all, and it causes very severe problems. But if you give those people manganese, um, you can reverse, at least partly, some of this biochemical issue of glycosylation. And so it leads to the question of, could there be uh, a subset of folks for whom this pathway, this glycosylation pathway, is important to their disease uh, and for whom there might be, uh, perhaps even by giving manganese, a way of uh, addressing it. I want to give you the caveat that this is not a treatment that is uh, in any way validated or anything or that you should be taking manganese for your mental health. That is not uh, what is coming out of these studies. But what it does do is it points us to a biological pathway, which again is something that we haven't had a whole lot of in the field, which is why a lot of um, the uh, you know the medicines that we have are based on some of the older science. Okay, that's a prelude to talking about what the biggest study in this country uh, that aims to advance precision medicine, and that is the All of Us Research Program. We are one nation, one people. When called upon to give from within, we come together and find that our capacity to help others is limitless. Here, we are fearless. What lies inside all of us is more than data. It's life. It's more than insight and medical research. It's vision and honor and compassion. What's flowing through America's veins is its diversity. The next great breakthrough will be found in each and every one of us. And what we find there will unlock mysteries, heal the sick, and eradicate disease. We ask for one million individuals to come forward and stand on this landmark in history. We ask America to do once again what she has always done, lead the way forward. We're one nation, one people, but all of us are different. And it's those very differences that will lead to answers for generations to come. So that is uh, the essence of what the All of Us program is about. And this was launched uh, or conceived several years ago. Uh, this is Francis Collins, who used to be the director of the National Institute of Health, under whom this uh, program uh, originated. And it is a historic study, uh, as you heard, to gather data from a million or more people to accelerate research, to improve health, using this framework of precision medicine to help individualize prevention, treatment, and care. And uh, it's, it's really um, a really ambitious study. I mean, really uh, building one of the largest, richest biomedical data sets available. And it's really also unique in a number of ways because it is uh, really a partnership between scientists or, or research and, and our participants, I'm a participant in the program, uh, and uh, it's really aiming to ensure that we can bring some of these advances to, to everybody. Um, so I'm gonna move past this, but you know, what are the questions we can address with this? Well, they're kind of endless. Um, 
but important ones? Can we slow or potentially stop different kinds of dementia? How do we prevent chronic pain? How do we better, um, you know, treat diabetes or, or or understand the way to get better treatments to people for for conditions like that? Uh, it, it's driven by some core values, which are I think are really important. Yeah, it's open to everybody. Uh, it is really aiming to reflect the the diversity of the United States. It's treating participants as partners, not subjects, building trust, a lot, you know, ensuring that people have access to their own information, and making sure that the data are used broadly so that uh, good ideas can move forward. Security and privacy are, of course, of tremendous importance when you're gathering these kinds of data. And um, there's a real commitment to, to make positive change and catalyze change. Uh, there are a lot of unique things about it, as I was alluding to. One is just the scale, a million or more people, uh, the, the, the kinds of different kinds of data that are being collected. Um, and, you know, they include, as we'll talk about, things like clinical data, environmental data, genetics, behavioral data, socioeconomic data, or social determinants of health, as we call it. Um, and there, you know, there are uh, a number of things that I think people get from uh, or, or, or feel valuable about participating. One is um, actually a chance to learn a little bit about your own health, as we've mentioned. Uh, well, I can mention now that one of the things that happens is uh, when genetic data or any other kinds of data are uh, analyzed, um, they are uh, you know, available to people. So people are getting genetic results back if they choose to. You don't have to. Um, uh, for many people, it's very important to ensure that their community is included. This is a really important thing about this research and research in general, as you may know. Um, if we are not inclusive, then the advances that come from this research are not going to be equitably available to people. There will be potentially communities left behind. And even for those who are included, Diversity of the research data actually enhances what we can learn uh, for everybody. Um, so uh, I mentioned that one of the things people uh, receive, if they wish to, is genetic results, health-related return of results. So you can learn about your genetic ancestry. People are familiar with that concept or other you know, traits that are of potential interest, but also uh, risk of developing certain serious health conditions that are related to genetics, and also what we call pharmacogenetics, uh, results about genes that influence how your body might react to certain medications. And what's really uh, remarkable is that the program offers free genetic counseling. So if you choose to get your genetic results, you have access to uh, genetic counselors who can help to interpret the results or help you decide what you want to do about it. Um, right now, participating means uh, that you, you know, enroll and you can do this online or you meet with staff if you're at a health system that's participating and give consent if you would like to participate. There are surveys to complete. There's a brief physical measurement visit which involves just simple things like heart rate and blood pressure and height and weight. Blood, the blood samples or saliva can be done, urine sample. And then uh, also uh, for many people, wearables or digital apps, Fitbit data and, and those kinds of things. Um, so it's very diverse kinds of data that are being collected. Um, I'm actually going to just spend a second here because we've already really talked about this, but there are many things that um, that I think researchers and, and non-researchers would hope to derive from this opportunity. You know, better understanding people's risk for different disorders or diseases, not just based on a few different risk factors we already know about, but, you know, the interaction of things like genes and environment, um, as well as 
developing solutions to health disparities. We talked earlier uh, or at the very beginning about the fact that there are a lot of disparities and outcomes among people. Why is that? What's driving it? Um, and hopefully, you know, creating a platform for what we call ancillary studies or trials that might, you know, if discoveries uh, are available to, you know, develop or, or test new treatments down the road. Diversity is a, is a huge aspect of this, as I mentioned, uh, not just diversity by race and ethnicity, but by geography, rural, urban, uh, data types that are very diverse, as we just talked about. Uh, people with all kinds of health status, ill, um, people living with disabilities, uh, people who are healthy and just want to volunteer for research. Um, in the realm of genetics, <clears throat> This diversity issue is really holding back a lot of progress. That is the fact that we're not diverse. Most of the big genetic studies that have been done are overwhelmingly based on uh, people who are of European ancestry. And you can see here, it's like 95%. And what that means is that we are missing a lot of genetic variation, and we're also potentially missing um you know the 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 usefulness of genetic discoveries that might be uh, broader than for those of just european ancestry the program actually began uh, officially launched um nearly 6 years ago now uh more than 780,000 people have signed up um and 45% or so are from racial or ethnic minorities more than 80% are what we would call underrepresented in biomedical research. And that is, is includes race and ethnicity, but also um, uh, based on things like um, rural or, uh, you know, urban or, you know, uh, older age uh, or um, uh, people of sexual and gender minorities or people living with disabilities and so on. It's really an effort to make sure that everybody is included. Here in uh, the Boston area, we uh, and 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 surrounding areas, we have all of us New England. We've enrolled about thirty-five thousand folks to date through the Mass General Brigham and Boston Medical Center um, health centers, and in the Berkshires, uh, there is also a, a site enrolling as well. And um, it's just been a, a remarkable experience to um, to offer this to people in the community and to really partner with folks in making this happen. The data are now becoming available on a very large scale. So, you know, 413,000 survey uh, responses. And these are data that are already available to researchers. Um, and there are now more than 10,000 researchers who are using the data, um, whole genome sequence and Fitbit data and electronic health records. And you can just imagine how fertile this is for learning about uh, just a whole variety of diseases and health conditions. Now, the issue uh, that obviously I'm sure has occurred to you is where is this, where is this data? And how do how is it protected? Because of course, a lot of those things I just showed you are pretty, um, sometimes they're sensitive and, and often they're sensitive and people wanna make sure that they're safe and secure and their privacy is maintained. And the program has a deep commitment to doing that. Um, and there is a, um, the data are stored very securely uh, in a, a cloud-based environment. There is rigorous security testing the data are, of course, encrypted and identifiers are removed. Uh, researchers have to agree to a code of conduct before accessing the data. Uh, there's a certificate of confidentiality that protects disclosures. Um, and, you know, if any kind of data breach were to occur, uh, you know, people would be notified right away. Um, and the model for the data are unique in many ways. You know, in most cases, uh, speaking as a researcher, what happens is if you are accessing data, um, even if it's data that were collected from another study, you might request the data and then you 
you know, you're approved, let's say, and you then get a copy of the data. The model here is, is very different. The, instead of the data going to the researchers, the researchers have to go to the data. So the data stay in one place, their use is, is you know, audited, it's protected. Uh, they're not, uh, you, you know, you can't download or act, you know, uh, receive the data set in any way. It is in this secure enclave, which I think is a really uh, wonderful way of doing it and maintaining um, people's confidentiality and, and privacy. I'm gonna do, well, I have demo here. One thing I thought I might do, if I can get it to work here, would be to, can you still see my screen? Um, are you seeing it? I don't know if anybody can come on mic or just- um, we're, Right now we're seeing the NIH, National Good. Institutes of Health. Perfect. Okay. okay, so now I'm going to go to, uh, so anybody, everybody here in the, um, you know, in the audience can access the All of Us Research Hub. This doesn't mean you're going to get access to all that data that I just showed you, but there are certainly, uh, but there are certain uh, aggregate data uh, that you can look at Um what you know that 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 doesn't refer to individuals, uh, but that you can look at to uh, to get a feel for what's there. So let's look at the data browser. And what you get here, first of all, there's lots of videos and FAQs and so on. But let's say you wanted to know um, something about what's in the data and how many people have a condition among the people who have participated. So, Let's pick something. Let's say, um, well, let's say diabetes. So I would type in diabetes and hit return. And now it tells me that um, from the electronic health record, there are lots of different diabetes concepts in there. There are labs related to that. There are procedures, there are survey questions. So let's actually just go here. I'm gonna click on that and it shows me the top 10 conditions uh, related to diabetes and how many people, participants have this. So you can see that diabetes overall, about 60, well, it tells you right here, if I hover over it, 59,560. Um, I can also uh, look in more detail. So if I wanted to look at that 59,560, uh, first of all, here's the, the prevalence in the cohort. Um, I can also click here and see how does it break down by sex, by age. Um, I can, you know, I can look at all kinds of different things. And this is just the electronic health records for one condition. Um, we could look at, you know, labs, measurements. So uh, those of you may know that hemoglobin A1C is a blood test that we use to monitor uh, blood glucose over time. Um, so these data are all there, et cetera. Um, we can also look at data snapshots. Let's see. Uh, this sort of just gives you a feeling for lots of details about you know, what's what's there in the data set. We can also look at the research projects directory. Again, I'm not, I'm not logging in with anything here. You can do this yourself by going to the website and exploring. Um, so if we go here, uh, it will tell me the research project. If I want to do a research project or use the data, obviously I have to go through all kinds of certifications and, you know, there has to be a, a data use agreement and a variety of other things, but people have done that. In fact, more than 10,000 active projects are listed in this projects directory. And everybody who signs up and, and gets access has to say, you know, what is it you're looking at? And it's completely transparent. So you as a maybe non-researcher could look up and see who's doing this research, what question are they addressing? So let's again, take, um, I don't know, diabetes. Uh, I hit return, and now it shows me that there are 323 projects that have diabetes 
just in the project title. Um, let's say I wanted to look at uh, this one, genetics of diabetes. It tells you the, the question that's being studied. Uh, what's the approach? How are they going to look at this? What do they think they might find? Um, and then who are the researchers involved? And um, neighborhood environment. And so people are looking at all kinds of things. And I think what this shows you is that it's already become a, an engine of uh, discovery. You can also look at um, what are some of the surveys that uh, people complete, and you can actually see the the actual survey if you wanted to look at the the basic survey that's given at enrollment, asking basic demographic questions and things like that. If you're a member of the, uh, if you sign up, you you have an app and you can look at your own uh, information or get results. You can fill out surveys on that as well. So there's a lot there, even if you uh, just want to explore what is the study about. Okay, um, let me also give you, how are we doing on time? Oh, we're okay, I think. Uh, so where was I? Okay, so we did that. Let me go back here. Okay. The science is beginning to, you know, it started a few years ago, and already there's some major scientific dividends. So just last month, this paper appeared in, in, in the journal Nature, which, as you may know, is sort of, you know, one of the world's leading journals. And it was the first sort of overall analysis of whole genome sequence data for about 250,000 participants in the program. And there were a lot of fascinating things, but one of the fascinating things was that this study, this one study identified 275 million new genetic variants that had not been identified before. Just about, you know, variation in our human genome that had not been identified. One of the, and 4 million of those are thought to be potentially related to disease risk. And one of the reasons that these things hadn't been identified is we hadn't previously had the scale or the size of these data, but more importantly, the diversity. So some variation are seen in some populations or some uh, uh, you know, different backgrounds that people have. Uh, and this is how you make those kinds of discoveries. In our own research, we've begun to use the data. These are, I'll just give you two examples of uh, studies that we've done looking at the all of us data. And we were interested in some of the factors that led to what, uh, as you probably know, was a pretty striking increase in depression or depressive symptoms uh, since the, the pandemic. And in this study, we were able to look at um, what is the effect of discrimination on depressive symptoms. Discrimination was in particular, I mean, it's a longstanding issue, obviously, people feeling um, discrimination or experiencing it. But in the pandemic, we saw uh, an even greater, um, you know, sort of presence and attention to discrimination based on race, ethnicity. There was anti-Asian discrimination early in the pandemic, not that it's gone away. Um, and we wanted to know what's the effect of that? Is that contributing in some way? And the study, uh, in the study, we did a, a something called the COPE survey, which was a, a participant experience, COVID participant experience survey, repeatedly asking people about how they were doing, what was their experience of the pandemic? What we found was really pretty striking. Among those who experienced discrimination, more than once a week, they had a 17-fold increased risk of moderate to severe depression uh, compared to those who weren't experiencing depression, uh, discrimination, and an 11-fold increased odds of suicidality. And the strongest effects were when the reason for discrimination was race, ancestry, or national origins, as opposed to, as opposed to say, discrimination based on age or gender. 
high levels of everyday discrimination were as strongly associated with moderate to severe depressive symptoms as having a history of a, of a mood disorder in the past, uh, which is a, a pretty powerful risk factor. On the other hand, we were also interested in the, the prevention aspect. And as I mentioned, we've been interested in social support for a while. And so we asked the question, is there a protective or was there a protective effect uh, of social support? And again, the pandemic was sort of a perfect storm of disrupting social connection, right? Because people during lockdown were separated. <laughs> people were maintaining social or physical distance uh, just to protect themselves and so on. Uh, and what we found, again, looking over several months of data, uh, repeated measures, was that social support was a powerful protective factor. So overall, we looked at, at different kinds of social support, but overall, those experiencing high levels of social support at a 55% lower odds of depression developing during that period. And uh, we looked at emotional, informational support, like you can lean on people or get important information, positive social interactions, uh, or tangible support, like people were giving you uh, resources or, or money when you need it or that kind of thing. Um, the most impactful were the emotional or social kinds of support, positive social interaction support. <clears throat> but those who were receiving all kind, all three of those types of support had an 85% lower odds of depression. So um, again, I think it really underscores what many of you said in the chat, which is that this is so essential to our, our mental health. Um, I want to just... Uh, leave you with a couple of pieces of information. If you're interested in reading more about the program, there are now many articles that have been published. Um, the data browser I showed you here, uh, which you can, you know, you can Google it as well and, and get to it. And there's a researcher workbench, which has all of, uh, you know, how you would access the data um, more broadly. And this is probably your go-to researchalloofus.org uh, website that you can learn more about it and you can sign up uh, you can enroll yourself if you like one of the things that <clears throat> as i mentioned is a is a value or a um uh, a goal of the program is to make this available to everybody um and open to all so um i encourage you to explore and i'm gonna leave it there and and um be happy to take some questions I just wanted to uh, point out before you start going through the questions that we had um, inquiries from Maine, South Dakota, and Hawaii about wow. joining the All of Us Research Program. So there's a lot of interest, and and I, I don't think you can emphasize that enough. Yeah, that's how to join. How to join? Yeah, yeah. Go to researchallofus.org, and and it'll walk you through. Okay. Um. So, you know, there, there are places in the country like us in Boston, uh, you know, New York and, you know, many places around the country, uh, hundreds of sites where uh, you can go to a, a health provider or health system and enroll face to face. But you can also enroll online or digitally and then arrange to have the other parts of your participation um, uh, sort of at your convenience. So, um Okay, so let's let's take some questions then. Um, uh, let's see. I'm going to go way back because uh, it, uh, it's wonderful to see that a number of people have um, asked some of these questions. So I'm, I'm seeing where we went back to the question I asked you about wh what were the protective factors. I think that's when we got most of... Uh, uh, okay, so now I'm going to go to a question about... Uh, are certain people predisposed to getting PTSD? Uh, if so, is there a way to prevent before war and other tragic events uh, that cause it? That's a great question. It does appear that certain people are more predisposed. And um, part of that is, it does appear to be a genetic component. So there have now been uh, genetic studies that have 
documented that the risk of PTSD has some genetic component, certainly not the majority of the component uh, being genetic, but uh, it is heritable to a certain degree. Um, and some people uh, are predisposed by virtue of other environmental factors. So for example, or experiential factors, people who've experienced childhood adversity or trauma who may not have developed PTSD, but that's sort of a sensitizing effect so that further adversity or trauma, uh, they may, in the presence of further adversity or trauma, may be at greater risk. Um, people, uh, obviously, there are certain types of traumatic exposures that are particularly uh, more likely to uh, be associated with uh, the development of PTSD. They include um, sexual violence um, and uh, uh, a number of uh, situations, but you know, it's a pretty broad uh, a list of things that can uh, cause PTSD, um, including, of course, combat exposure, combat trauma, um, and uh, you know, severe accidents or disasters. One thing that is notable, though, is that if you look at how many of us are exposed to a traumatic event at some point in our lives, it's by far most of us. So you know, maybe eighty percent. But only about one in 10 people who are exposed develop PTSD. So clearly there are, uh, you know, as the question implies, risk factors or differences. And there's a lot of research that's aimed at trying to understand that. We did find, for example, though, that social connection uh, was, um, it, it, we did a study in, uh, uh, in a large uh, military cohort before and after deployment to combat. And it did seem that social cohesiveness was protective against um, things like uh, depression. Uh, we didn't look specifically at PTSD in that case, um, but we might imagine that it would be um, sort of similar. Okay. Uh, so let's see. Uh, some people uh, commented on, on what the VA is doing today. I think that might have had to do with the suicide stuff maybe, because there is a program in the VA that is um, uh, similar uh, in terms of trying to help identify people who may be at greatest risk and, and proactively reach out. Um, does the research protocol resulting in manganese as a factor in mental illness hold any promise for Alzheimer's? That's a really interesting question. Uh, not that I am aware of. Uh, and uh, we need to do a lot more work to know if it's even helpful clinically uh, in, say, schizophrenia. Um, but, you know, it's that kind of research that I was describing that sort of points us to new clues. Um, let's see. Uh, um, there's some sound issues. Um, website to join the All of Us program. Uh, uh, as I mentioned again, research allofus.org would be a good place to go. Um, where in Berkshire County can people go? There is a, um, 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 mm, I'm blanking on it now. Uh, Mary Jane, you may know. Uh, it's... Um, well, actually, um... That's part of the problem. I'm not sure there is. Um, uh, I, I was looking at, at some of these questions. Um, Reliant, Reliant, uh, I thought. Reliant practice in, in the Berkshires, I thought. Uh, Reliant? Uh, um, somebody out there in the audience help me. I don't, I don't know that we have Reliant out here. Um, yeah. <clears throat> uh, you know, I was wondering if the program at some point could do something like a bio bus. Um, where it could go to some areas mm -hmm. that that don't have centers. I had to go to MGH um, to to have samples drawn, uh, or actually to your site near MGH. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but uh, I, I'm wondering if you know you talk about 
communities left behind um, uh, without being cavalier about it, some, some of our more rural areas like the Berkshires could fit into that. And yeah. I'm wondering yeah. if there are either ways of working with the medical centers we have to collect the samples or to send a bio, some kind of a mobile van out to some of these areas in rural Maine, in, in the Dakotas. I mean, places that don't have access to um, academic medical centers um, yeah. uh, and so forth. So, um, and that is but a real, I, yeah. Sorry, go I mean, I've been, I've been part of um, uh, the All of Us program for a couple of years now. I've, um, I've su um, uh, submitted saliva samples. I've gotten some genetic data back. I've got the Fitbit. Um, but I mean, I think, I think uh, there's a whole population that is, not participating that would love to participate. Uh, yes, I agree. I'm, so I think uh, you raise a really good point. Um, I can't believe I'm blanking on the name of the health system. Uh, You're not thinking of CHP, Community Health Pro uh, Programs, are you? Uh, no, I, uh, it's part of one of the All of Us consortia called the TAC Consortium. And I believe they are still enrolling uh, in Western Mass, but uh, we can check that and, and get information to you. I agree with you about the, you know, the importance of making sure that all communities are included. We've actually had some discussions with Maine, um, and there are uh, ways of enrolling, as I said, online. Uh, they are making it much easier to not have to come into one of the medical centers, but to do, you can go to Quest or to other um, facilities to have the samples collected. And you can also donate your electronic health records, for example, uh, through digital means. Um, and and there, the, the All of Us program has a support center. So if you go to that uh, website that I mentioned, you can contact the support center and ask basically any question you want. But those questions would be great ones for people individually to ask about what's, what's nearest to me and... Um, how can I enroll? When you try to, when you enroll, it will, pro I believe this is still the case where it will list centers that are near you, but if they're not near you, you should be able to enroll in any case. Um, uh, is there, uh, let's see, how, uh, and the idea of a, of a bus or a mobile van, there is a, a mobile, what they call a mobile asset, but it's a mobile, it's a, a bus that goes around the country. It's, uh, and some centers do have mobile um, enrollment uh, opportunities, uh, but uh, we don't hear, and um, it's a good idea. I mean, I think you're right. Bringing, bringing it to people where they are is a, is a really helpful thing to do. I mean, it would be helpful to bring it into Springfield, it, but it would be very helpful to bring it into Berkshire County. We have what's called an underserved um, medical population out here. When I asked about a year and a half ago about um, facilities in Western Mass, yeah. I was directed to Westboro, Massachusetts, and that ain't Western Mass. <laughs> okay. That's uh, that's just nowhere near. So, I mean, I think... Uh, um, you know, I think something should be done. And it's not only in, in Western Mass, it's in these more rural areas that you would get people who want to join, but can't. Yeah. yeah. Oh, not, they can join, but they can't submit the samples and the, the, the you know, uh, to, to take it a step further. Okay. Yeah. I think that problem has largely been addressed, but um, I can either find out more for you about the specifics for Western Mass, or anybody can go to the All of Us site and and contact the support uh, center to get that information as well, which um, is definitely worth doing, I think. Uh, okay. there's a question about, um, has a genetic factor for alcoholism been identified? Mm -hmm. uh, and... The answer is yes, there have been a lot of genetic studies of alcohol use and alcoholism. Uh, originally, they were family and twin studies, which suggested that alcohol uh, alcoholism uh, does a run in families and has a heritable component, meaning that some of the risk 
uh, that's you know in the population of who ends up developing alcoholism is due to genetic differences between people. Um, and more late, more recently, uh, we've been and others have been pursuing very large scale genetic studies using actually DNA samples and so on. And those have become very large now. And they are also showing that there is this heritable component, even when you uh, look at the level of the DNA, not that there's a, it's, it's not a genetic disease in the sense uh, that, you know, like a cystic fibrosis that we talked about where there's a mutation and that causes somebody to have the disease. But like for most conditions that we study in medicine that are common, uh, genetic variation is a risk factor. And, you know, there may be lots of little variations in the genome that contribute a little bit. If you add them up, they contribute, you know, uh, a noticeable amount. Uh, and what's one of the interesting findings that's emerged recently is that the genes that influence alcohol use are not necessarily the same as the genes that influence uh, alcohol use disorder or what you might call alcoholism. So there, it's a it's a very complex thing. So whether people develop the actual alcohol use disorder um, involves uh, not quite the same. It's not simply having more of the same. Um, one of the genes that's been uh, uh, really pretty substantially uh, validated as being involved and, and largely in a protective way is a gene that's involved in how people break down alcohol. Uh, and people who have a certain variation of this gene are less likely to develop alcoholism. And in some ways that's uh, because they are, they experience symptoms uh, that are kind of really unpleasant when they drink. Uh, you, people may uh, know of or recall the drug antabuse, which basically is a drug that kind of does the same thing. And it's used to you know, help people stay off of alcohol. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, who do I contact? I see one about uh, joining all of us when uh, at uh, Brigham and Women's. That's near here. Uh, absolutely, you can go to our All of Us uh, New England website and uh, and reach us, and we will arrange that for you, uh, hopefully. Um, but if you have any problem with that, let me know. Um, let's see, any other questions that are, I may have skipped a couple, but um, uh, I, some of these are, are uh, on some of the same topics. Um, let's see if I skipped any here. Regarding psychiatric disorders, how will TMS be utilized in the future to treat those disorders? So TMS is transcranial magnetic stimulation. One of the things that we didn't really talk about, but uh, in addition to medication and psychotherapy for things like depression, for example, there are other treatments that we have. Some of them have been around for a long time, uh, probably most famously uh, ECT, or electroconvulsive therapy, which is actually considered the most effective treatment for severe depression. Um, but another one that is more recently used and is um, maybe increasingly used is something called transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is a way of um, presumably uh, um, modulating brain circuits that contribute to depression. And uh, I think it has already become a part of our toolkit, especially for people who have not responded to some of the, the easier uh, first line things like trying an SSRI. So that is definitely one of the, the treatments that's out there. You may have heard that there are other new treatments for depression that uh, one of them is, is 
approved and out there, which is a, a variant of ketamine. Um, uh, and then there are psychedelics that people are studying very intensively to see how helpful they could be. Theirs are not yet approved, but um, there's been a lot of interest in that. Um, there was a question here about, is all of us um, restricted to the U.S. or is it international? Hmm. It's restricted to the U.S. in terms of uh, enrollment, yeah. Now, there, 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 are, there are similar efforts, not as diverse, in other countries. So, for example, even before all of us, there was the UK Biobank, so, uh, which uh, enrolled about 500,000 uh, folks and has generated a tremendous number of research findings. Uh, there's one in Finland, there's one in Japan and China. Um, they're, they're all different. Uh, and indifferent in the kinds of data that they have. There's another very large one in our country uh, called the Million Veteran Program, which is affiliated with the VA. Uh, and that has been um, also incredibly uh, fruitful in terms of uh, science. So this is the, the way, you know, I think people are increasingly realizing that many of the discoveries that are gonna make a real difference require lots of diverse and large scale data. That's how these things are going to happen. It's no longer just somebody working in a lab, <laughs> uh, you know, looking to see if mold grows on their bread, which of course was a major discovery that led to penicillin. Um, uh, but now it's, you know, it's often big science in this way. There's a question here that will the data, will any of the data from the All of Us Research Program be sold to AI companies to train their models? No, there's no selling of the data. Um, the, uh, the um, you know, one, one uh, issue that I, I think the program uh, is, uh, you know, interested in is not restricting the data to just the usual sort of ivory tower researchers necessarily, but making it available more broadly to people who, for example, there are classes, uh, uh, you know, teachers and university classes that have begun to use some of the data, not necessarily the, all that individual level data, but um, to spur discovery. You know, you never know where the discoveries are going to come from, and of course, industry or companies. Are, can be very helpful. When you think about um, translating research findings to actual treatments, they are typically a crucial partner. And so finding ways to responsibly uh, ex, you know, a, a expand um, collaboration or access, I think is something that is of great interest to do, but not selling data. Um, there's a question about sharing this PowerPoint presentation after the talk, and yes, that will be that will be um, uh, uh, posted on the Ali website. I think uh, if Ray or Judith, if you want to jump in on that uh, to give any details, um, there was a, a so so it will be available. Um, there's another question here about. Um, are there going to be, are there any quotas in the All of Us program by age, gender, ethnicity, and so forth? There aren't quotas, but um, we, we, the program does oversample, meaning uh, we want to ensure that the, that there is really good representation. And so, um, you know, uh, it's not like there's some specific, uh, uh, either lower or upper limit. Um, but one of the things that I think we, you know, pride ourselves on or the program prides itself on is an unprecedented degree of diversity across many different dimensions. And there's been a particular focus on <clears throat> groups or communities that have been underrepresented in the past. Uh, and I mentioned some of them, race, ethnicity is one, but, you know, age, rural, uh, uh, gender minorities, uh, disability, low income, um, and so on. So there's a lot of effort to ensure, to do outreach and engagement. Uh, there are national and local engagement partners and uh, community partners that we work very closely with to, again, to make sure. And, you know, part of it is that some communities who have, who have not been represented in research 
are not necessarily represented for different reasons. So for example, for some, there have been past really bad experiences with research, frankly, uh, or even abuses. And people are wary and not and understandably not trusting of, you know, why would I give my information and where is it going to go? And so some of it is about outreach, engagement, edu education, building trust. Others uh, may not have participated because, you know, they weren't invited to participate or, uh, you know, there was some exclusive inclusion criteria that they didn't meet. So that's that's what the program is really trying to uh, address or remediate. Um, um, you, you know, <laughs> if, um, if there were a way of, of educating PCPs uh, to the existence of this and to, to, to encourage them in their practices to, to point this availability out to their patients, um, that would be, that would be an extraordinary help. I mean, and many, in, many federally qualified health centers um, to send that information out as well. Okay, I just wanted to- The program does have many federally qualified health centers participating and in many communities, it it uh, the FQHCs are crucial components or partners in the program. You're absolutely right. So if anybody from CHP is listening, um, there you have you have some information. I just wanted to say that I did look up that we do have a Quest facility in Pittsfield, um, a Quest Diagnostics, and I'll call them tomorrow and see if they know anything about this about uh, collecting samples for all of us and. I guess what I'll do is um, I'll, I'll report it back to the Ali office, and um, and they may be able to to put it somewhere on their website so we can see if uh, um, you know that that message can get out um, to people in the area. But if anybody has any contacts at either Berkshire Medical Center or at uh, CHP or at Vim to put this message out, um, okay. So yeah. Okay, this is this is another one that's interesting. Um, uh, getting the word out about all of us employer ERG affinity groups, which is a new term for me, but but um, um, uh, you know, I think I think the more the word goes out. I mean, I when I mention all of us to people here that I know, not many of them are familiar with it. So, um, ah, here's an interesting question. Does diet play any significant role in meta in mental disorders? Hmm, that is an interesting question. There's a lot of interest in that, uh, both because, um, uh, you know, in fact, recently there's been some work about, you know, processed food and super processed food uh, and its association with some mental symptoms. You know, those dietary studies are very challenging to do. Because unless it's done in a very controlled setting, you often don't know how much of the of the effect is a correlation, how much of it is, you know, how adequately are people reporting their diet. But there is a large literature that has suggested connections. And interestingly, one of the, the first and biggest ancillary study of the All of Us Research Program is something called Nutrition for, for Precision Health. And it is uh, not just on medical, uh, mental health, uh, but it's looking at nutrition and precision approaches to nutrition in a uh, much deeper uh, dive and at, at various levels, uh, all the way up to uh, a group of folks who would be in a um, control, you know, in, in a metabolic environment to, to study the effects of diet, but also using AI to try to design optimal diets. Um, the other interest in mental health that has some data, although it's still really an evolving field, is what's the effect of diet on the microbiome, which I don't know if you've talked about in this course. Yeah, but, we have. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and how might that actually affect uh, mental health or brain function? And there is some pretty intriguing evidence, although I, I have to say I don't, A, I'm not an expert in it, but B, um, I think it really needs a lot of work to to know how to sort it out. Really, um, I, um, I noticed that when I looked at 
uh, the this consortium that I was thinking of, the Reliant Medical Group that's in uh, its central mass. Um, yeah. That's. I think it, it might be in Worcester. Yes, I think it might be in Worcester. Hmm. Yeah. It doesn't help you though. No, no. But I mean, if if the if all the all of us research program could, you know, possibly contact upper management at Berkshire Medical Center, at uh, community health programs, at volunteers in medicine, at Bay State, um, at um, uh, well, you know, Western Mass. I think I think we would be deeply appreciative of that. So. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you again, over and over again, uh, uh, for this talk um, and and for the information that you provided with uh, us, and it gives us um, here something concrete to to engage in and to pay it forward, if you will. Um, and and I'm I'm very very happy that, that you agreed to do this. Thank you, Dr. Smoller. Thank you for everyone who's joined in. And uh, if you have any sort of feedback about the class, uh, that would be terrific about the whole four part series. So thank you, everyone have a good and safe evening and um, we'll do it again. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Right. Bye. Bye-bye.